Yes. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to our session this afternoon, where we're joined by Professor Linda Hogan. Professor Hogan is a professor of ecumenics mm -hmm. at the School of Religion in Trinity College, Dublin, and she was a recently a candidate for the post of Provost of Trinity, the first, which has now been filled by uh, another professor, Linda, Linda Doyle, uh, and she will take up the post in August. But the role of academics in Irish life is significant. And I'm hoping to talk to Linda this afternoon about our own life and about uh, the uh, subjects that uh, are most close to her heart. You started out life in uh, Callan County Kilkenny, is that right, Linda? Um, Ian, I was uh, born in Callan and went to school in St. Bridget's College, um, uh, taught by the Sisters of Mercy there. And um, But my family is from Callan. Um, my father was born in Callan, Hogan's. They were, they had a, a shop in, uh, uh, in um, um, Mill Street. And my mum was uh, from the Gardner family on Green Street. So we're very embedded in, um, in Callan. Um, and uh, so I went to school in St. Bridget's College, as I said, and uh, I, I, I mean, I've said this um, so many times, I got an absolutely fantastic education. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It was a very academically oriented school and with, um, you know, tremendous focus on academics, on achievement. There's no doubt about it. And I, I mean, I think probably there are uh, ways in which it needed to develop and has developed since in terms of, you know, the breadth of um, skills and, you know, aptitudes that people had. But for me, at least, um, the school suited my temperament very well. Um, and But when I finished school, which was in 1982, um, I was a bit uncertain about what I wanted to do. I, um, I was very interested in a whole range of subjects. Uh, but I really didn't, couldn't see myself in a particular career. So um, I just chose subjects that I was really interested in, history and theology, religion. Um, and uh, actually with the intention of doing a degree in theology and history and then probably going on to do law. That was what I had in my head at the time. But um, when I got into the study of theology and also of history, I just got captivated by the themes. And um, I suppose you might wonder, one can understand with history why one would be captivated with uh, it, because, um, you know, it's a it's a subject that many, many Irish people have a huge interest in. And I retain my interest in history. But um, why I was interested in theology and religion is really, I suppose, as I was looking at around the context in which I was living, it was a time of a lot of debate in Ireland about the role of the church, with discussions about, you know, would there be a divorce referendum? Should Ireland be a, a country that had... Um, sort of its social and cultural norms dominated by a particular religious tradition. So I was very interested in the politics of religion and, um, you know, and also in, I suppose, uh, late teenagers' uh, interest in, you know, the big questions of human purpose, human existence. Um, and so I, I went and studied theology and history in Maynooth. Um, and that's where I, uh, and when I finished that, I continued and did a master's there uh, in um, theology. And then when I finished that, I just continued and went to Trinity to do a PhD. And ended up in working in Trinity, but starting out doing theology and history in Maynooth, which is, uh, it uh, has a particular image in the minds of most people that it's a Catholic uh, seminary, first of all, as well as a university. Did that shape the theological thinking in you? Um, I, I suppose it, when I look back on it now, I think yes. Uh, but I think when I was there um, through the 80s, it was actually a very free and sort of 
and cultural context. You know, I was taught by, you know, great academics who had international reputations. Enda McDonough um, became a very close friend and mentor of mine. Um, Raphael Gallagher, Pat Hannan, they were all all men actually, but they were all people who were sort of trying to push the boundaries of um, theological education and also, um, you know, very involved in uh, issues of social justice and um, sort of freeing, I suppose, the, um, the theological landscape. So I was hugely influenced by, by them. And actually for my undergraduate dissertation, I wrote a, a, a thesis on feminist theology. So that was in 1985 in Maynooth. Uh, uh, so it was, you know, it was, you know, the image of a conservative place sort of belies the experience that I certainly had when I was there. Well, indeed. And I can just imagine, you know, uh, that people's thinking has been shaped by in many ways by looking back historically but when you get people like uh enda mcdonough who was if i who's just died recently um that uh, people like him who was he was one of the first uh roman catholic canons of saint patrick's cathedral mm -hmm. uh, which played uh you know uh, uh, that brings me then to the concept uh moving on from theology to ecumenics and uh, we all think well, at least in my limited frame of reference, think of ecumenics as, uh, or ecumenism as, say, the, uh, the week of prayer for Christian unity that's held uh, once a year, barely, uh, is geared towards helping the Roman Catholic and uh, Protestant churches come closer together. But it's a much broader topic than that, isn't it? It, it is, absolutely. And, um, you know, when I... Uh, uh, I it, 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 it's really uh, certainly as as it's been interpreted and developed by the Irish School of Ecumenics, which is where I came back to from the UK in 2001. Um, the Irish School of Ecumenics sort of really from the 1970s onward um, really instituted this um, area of study, which was very interdisciplinary. It took, you know, the classic themes of theology, the unity of Christians. It, it added to it studies in ethics and political science and really became a place where uh, we looked at a whole range of areas of conflict, social, political, and religious, and looked at ways of, um, you know, understanding those conflicts and then understanding the basis on which those conflicts might be mediated or um, uh, resolved. And so um, my background and the way I came to the Irish School of Ecumenics and into this uh, professor of ecumenics was um, my training in theology, <laughs> specifically on um, ethics. And so uh, what I've been looking at and what I've brought, I suppose, to the school is this focus on what are the ethical imperatives in terms of not only the unity of Christians, but also um, other contexts of conflict. Uh, so, so the School of Ecumenics now within the School of Religion has, um, you know, political scientists, historians, scholars of religion, theologians, ethicists, all concerned with um, a whole series of issues about conflict and their and its resolution. And. Um where does ethics come in this? I env envisage ethics as, you know, uh, helping us deal with where values conflict with one another and how we reach a consensus as to what, uh, uh, where ethics fits in all aspects, particularly politics. Yeah. Yes, and, and actually, you know, um, going back to um, my training in theology, within the field of theology, like any field, it's divided into different sort of themes or disciplines. And the, the theme that I chose was ethics. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so that's where I, what I've been working on really over these last 25 years. Um, and it is, uh, for me, it's, it's about understanding the sort of the sources of values and, you know, understanding how values are interconnected with the cultures from which they come. And then 
uh, understanding also how um, uh, when values conflict, what should be given priority and how we come to understand what should be given priority and how we resolve the inevitable conflicts of values that we encounter you know, every day, really. Can you give us an example of how, for example, during COVID, how we might face conflicting values and how we reach a resolution um, well, you know, COVID is, um, it's, it's a very good example, I suppose, of um, where on the one hand, what it, do, what it has done is really accentuate and amplify the problems that we already have in our society, but also then brings new problems with us, with them. I, I suppose the most current um, example of this ethical debate that's underway with COVID is about vac vaccine, access to vaccines and um, not only access to vaccines and who should get it when um, in the global north, but also how we um, deal with the big problem of access to vaccines in the global south. And you, you, that's, as you know, something that's being uh, debated currently. And, you know, there, there are, um, I suppose, on the one hand, you might say, well, of course, universal access is vital, and so patents should be waived. So, you know, it seems on, on the face of it that the ethical imperative is clear. But on the other hand, you know, you, you, you see that the real um, sort of the, the dynamism for innovation comes from the pharmaceutical companies that really do need the investment in order and and the economic imperative to um you know to um uh, make investment and continue this innovation so you can see there where values collide or conflict um but you know i i think on this issue myself um you know uh, it well first of all it was entirely predictable you know at the beginning of the the um, uh, the crisis. Um, uh, people were already talking about how and when there would be global access to vaccines, but you know I I, I think that um, the, the the there is an ethical imperative I think to at least suspend if not waive patents in the short term um, because um, you know there there's um, access to vaccines in the context of this terrible pandemic is something that I think is vital for, you know, for, for humanity. And I think um, it's one of the places where we can actually really demonstrate global solidarity. There are very few occasions, you know, where we get the opportunity to demonstrate the value of that solidarity. And this is one, and it could make a huge difference within an 18 month period, I think. Well, I think more than that, I think if we don't do it, until the global south is vaccinated, the northern, the global north is not safe. So there is, if you like, enlightened self-interest uh, in all of this. So, and that often shapes people's ethical perspective. Yes. It's uh, it, me first and then the rest of the world. Um, but when you're, when a topic like ethics is being taught, how do you teach uh, people to, I, I always think the best thing about universities isn't so much that it teaches you facts, but teaches you how to think. And yeah. how do uh, our people's, uh, how is people's thinking shaped by studying a course like ethics? Um, well, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I've been teaching ethics for, as I said, about 25 years now, and my approach to it has changed over the years. I like to say that, you know, the objective in an ethics course is to make everyone an ethicist. And I always begin my classes by saying everybody is an ethicist and everybody needs to be an ethicist. So the purpose of the program is really to help us, first of all, pay attention to the values and really make explicit the values that we hold ourselves, then interrogate them and, you know, understand why we hold them whether they're justifiable or not, and then teach people, uh, you know, how to go through the process of really, I suppose, interrogating their own values and then understanding other people's values and context and, um, you know, the different aspects of 
life that have a bearing on what's significant or not in, in, in ethics. And also trying to help people to understand that, um, you know, what, where, where, um, where facts change or where understanding changes, maybe then our understanding of what is ethical also changes. And, you know, I, one of the things that I, I, uh, uh, teach a lot about actually is how does moral or ethical change happen? Because, you know, if you look through human history, you can see that um, at different times, people believe that it was ethical, for example, to do something. So slavery as an institution was regarded as the ethical, the just, the, the orderly way to run a society. So how does it happen that these, you know, radical changes happen? Um, and so it, it's very helpful for students to think about those things. How does ethical change happen for them then to begin to think about, well, what are, what are our blind spots mm. currently? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we, we do a lot of work on identifying blind spots, not only personal blind spots, but also cultural. And, you know, we do at the end of uh, one of the courses that I teach, I um, say, okay, 2066, uh, what, what does the world look like? What, what do we think, uh, looking back, what are the areas that we would think are really scandals, moral scandals now that when we look back a hundred years ago, we think, oh my goodness, how did people think like that? How did good people believe this or act like this? So, you know, it's, it's, that's the kind of um, teaching that I try to do. And um, I, I uh, more recently, I run this university wide uh, course called the ethics lab, and it's, it gathers scientists, natural scientists, health people, computer scientists, and hum humanities scholars together. And we, you know, over the course of a year, we identify the big ethical challenges that we face and we all um you know together well in different at different stages um try to bring our own disciplines to bear on these big questions and and I sort of orchestrate it so you know it's it's evolving all the time but it's it's a great subject to be involved in and I I I love it I have to say well, I think, you know, your enthusiasm comes across. I'm going to, if you don't mind, uh, share my screen and show a video about the uh, um, the ethics lab. Uh, if you don't mind, it, we've yeah. got it here. And uh, it's just two minutes long. Every generation has to grapple with groundbreaking and difficult ethical questions. And the ethics lab takes a unique approach by applying innovation and design thinking to ethics. I'm Linda Hogan, an ethics professor here at Trinity, and together with professors from across the university, including from law, computer science and statistics, genetics and microbiology, biochemistry and immunology, and in collaboration with Science Gallery, we invite you to debate, address, and hopefully resolve some of the big ethical challenges of our day. The ethical challenges we face today include issues like artificial intelligence, gene editing, and big data. But ethics today is not just concerned about the upper limits of science. Ethical questions are embedded in political contexts and include issues like globalization, truth in media, migration, multiculturalism, and inequality. In the ethics lab, you'll debate values and their prioritization, ethical biases and blind spots, intentions and consequences. And you'll do this in a lab environment with students and professors from across the university. You'll engage with specially commissioned TED style talks delivered online by leading thinkers, and you'll co-design solutions for the ethical challenges of the present and future across many fields, including health, technology, business, politics, education, and law. And when you've completed this module, not only will you have developed the skills of ethical analysis and understood the different facets of ethical integrity according to different ethical traditions, but you'll also have learned how to successfully negotiate difficult ethical contexts through the unique environment of the ethics lab. 
So join us in the Ethics Lab to debate the big ethical questions of our age and co-design solutions to address them. Ah, that's just a small example of the work that you do, I see. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Do you get many students queuing up to do this course? Well, we, we do. Well, the, let me say the first thing that I noticed there is how badly I need a haircut. <laughs> I think we're all struggling with that. Um, lockdown uh, has its uh, disadvantages. Not from um, today. <laughs> today. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, we 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 put a cap on on that um, uh, course of um, eighty five students because we want to have something that you know we can break the students into groups of twelve and you know have them have a real sort of um, interactive experience. Uh, so, but you know, it's oversubscribed every year. Um, I I do find that students are more and more interested in thinking about the ethical implications of the, the courses that they're doing, whether it's in law or technology or health. Um, and they, they really want to um, be uh, engaged with thinking about those aspects of their you know, future professions. And it's certainly also the case that, so we not only do some um, modules like that now or courses like that, but also, in many of the courses um, that uh, students are taking, there is an ethics component. 10 years ago, I suppose, um, the whole field of medical ethics became embedded in medical education, nursing education, etc. But I think that's really now expanded into other fields like technology and biochemistry and natural sciences. Um, and also history and, you know, uh, other uh, other humanities subjects where they're also thinking about the ethical issues that they encounter, whether they're going to be, you know, whether it's about um, uh, um, dealing with sensitive historical topics and how do you do that or, um, you know, how we deal ethically with the past and in, in the present. So students are very, very interested in, in these, more and more interested in it, and we, we have to cap the, the numbers on the courses, so it's great. Yeah, that's very encouraging, you know, to think that so many people are positively disposed towards at least developing the ability to think correctly or to think about finding solutions. But it's one thing to uh, immerse yourself in all of the talks, the lectures and the symposia and the tutorials about how to do the right thing. How do you then make it happen? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. And I think it's a challenge that everybody faces really. You know, I think, um, I, I, I do think that um, part of my real motivation for um, not only teaching ethics in my own sort of uh, school and department, but also, you know, inserting myself right across the university is that I really believe that, uh, you know, in, in universities, we're not only educating students about their topics we're actually forming the next generation of citizens and you know for me that's as important as the you know what students learn and so teaching students to really be concerned about not only individual self-interest but also the public good and the common good thinking about you know where um where culture in organizations impacts on uh, how they do their work when they're professionals you know all of that i think is is part of what we are need to be doing when we're educating young people uh, today but i also do quite a bit of um well uh, as much as i can of what i kind of call ethics consultancy so working often with organizations um, and, um, uh, 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 you know, different bodies, whether it's banks or, or uh, large organizations and businesses, or whether it's NGOs, really helping them think about how they structure their organization so that issues of ethics become as embedded in their organization as issues of profit or, you know, equality mm -hmm. of diversity. 
And, you know, I think that that I think we need to get there. And um, I think, again, you, when you look at all of these um, sort of analyses of great places to work now, you can see that people are attracted by organizations that are concerned with values and larger um, issues uh, uh, as well as um, issues of, you know, the, the discrete area that their kind of business interests are in. So I, I, I think that that's what it's about really moving from, as you say, in from theory to sort of practice, but that's everybody's responsibility. Ah, uh, yes, but we do need leaders. And uh, Dermot Gaynor, one of my colleagues, has put in a question. Has the arrival of people like Donald Trump into positions of leadership in the democratic world caused you as an ethicist to pull your hair out? Or do you see it as a great opportunity to heighten, broaden and spread debate on ethical issues and their implications? Um, both, actually. <laughs> um, first of all, yes, I, I mean, I, I, I think that the, you know, so much has been uh, written about Donald Trump and his leadership style and others like Bolsonaro and uh, um, Vladimir Putin, etc. But I, I, you know, I think that um, one of the things that it really does do is show how um, you know, how vital it is to have a, first of all, separation of powers. You know, I think that's one of the things that it really does show and also how important it is to have access to truthful and accurate information through media and other sources. Um, but I, I, I also think, you know, there's been a, a terrible coarsening of um, uh, civic life through this sort of emerging style of leadership. Uh, but I also think that, you know, um, there are counter examples as well, many of them. And, you know, uh, we, we, fair, we often don't kind of highlight and profile the counter examples there are of people who are really trying to make difficult decisions and balance goods and, you know, um, uh, give voice to a whole range of different values while still um, giving uh, leadership and dealing with challenging economic and other conditions. So, you know, I think actually, I think that the presence or the visibility of leaders like that who are so, you know, um, uh, egregiously uh, um, interested in self-interest and power as opposed to the kinds of values that democratic leaders should be interested in, um, uh, really, I think actually they serve to highlight the importance of a leadership that's based on, you know, values of dignity, of participation, and you know, collegiality, and all of those um, values. So, yeah, we we could talk forever, I suppose, on that topic. Yes, yes, and in many ways, you know, so many of the values that you espouse there, the positive values, are values that Rotary endeavours to spread throughout the world, and we're engaged in endeavouring to eliminate polio, for example, and one of the greatest barriers to uh, the two countries that are left where polio is still uh, not fully eradicated, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, has been religion, has been people saying, this is the devil being injected into you. And in many ways, we can put it down to education. And then you see the anti-vaccine uh, cohort of people in the Western world. And you wonder, you know, what hope is there when so many people can be uh, persuaded by false information, very often coming from people whom they respect as leaders? Uh, I think that's a big problem. And, you know, um, one of the reasons why I've always been really fascinated by and interested in religion is precisely because, as I said at the beginning, the power and influence that religion has over people's lives. And, um, you know, when you look at all of the research that's being done, religiosity is increasing rather than decreasing around the world. And, you know, over 90% of the world's population uh, believes in a religious tradition. So, you know, if there is to be real influence, particularly in issues like vaccination or, you know, let's uh, 
the value of science, progressive values, equality, etc. You have to engage with religion, I think. And one of the projects that I've been involved with over the last 10 years is a project um, run by the World Bank, which is about trying to engage religious leaders around the world um, uh, to accept uh, values of gender equality, because that's one of the things that's so important in terms of you know, improving people's lives around the world, improving education, improving health and access to health. So it's just another example, Ian, I think, but you're, you're absolutely right. Religious leaders and religious communities have to be engaged in order to be persuaded about uh, you know, the merits of something like vaccination. And, but it's a huge challenge. And what, what's happened over the last 30 years, you can see in the sort of, if you look at the analysis of the history of religion, is that in every single religious traditions, what's, what's tradition, what's happened is that the, the middle ground has been lost and, you know, religious traditions have become more extreme, either on, on either end in a way. And, uh, but of course that's happened globally also in secular society as well. So there is there is a big challenge, I think, to engage religious leaders. And I think, um, I think governments and international organizations and UN, World Bank, UNESCO, et cetera, they, they know how important it is to um, continue to engage religious traditions because they have such influence and sway over populations. And, uh, you know, Barack Obama uh, established a new um, uh, unit within the State Department to engage with religious traditions more explicitly because he knew that, you know, you know development and healthcare and education um, uh, and equality, issues of equality will only be um, uh, advanced if there is real engagement with those who are barriers uh, to to these um, progressive values. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at the moment at a world that is deeply divided and polarized. Uh, mm -hmm. Even uh, in, you know, we look at the United States and look for leadership from there. And I think that, you know, we can see in Joe Biden, for example, an ability to empathize, which is, I think, a great human characteristic. But uh, you'd like to think that the worldview that we have is shared. But of course, it's never going to be shared. We most of the Western world doesn't understand where uh, what people are thinking in Southeast Asia, for example, mm -hmm. parts of the world that have been devastated by invasion and by colonization and Africa. The, the world's large, that huge continent with such diversity, where the biggest problem isn't so much the West's ignor ignorance of, but tribalism. Mm. And tribalism uh, in our, uh, it is mimicked in many ways in politics in this country. If you look at what's happening in Northern Ireland, where we have loyalists versus nationalists, and yet religion seems to be underlying that. But there's very little real religion there. It's tribal rather than religion. I, I think that's true. And, um, you know, I, I, I think lots of the conflicts around the world have this sort of language of religious division, you know, overlaid on them, or maybe that's been the origin, but it's very often not about religious beliefs or practice or even culture. Um, so, but I think that's true, but I, but also I think that even when, it, when there is a sort of a very loose relationship with religion, nonetheless, religious leaders need to make sure that religion is not used to amplify those divisions. And just going back to your point about um, Southeast Asia and, and Africa, I mean, one of the things that I've learned a um, huge uh, amount from is um, engaging with scholars and activists from around the world, because um, uh, what you find is that there are analogous traditions and values uh, in different religious traditions and, um, and, and also cultural traditions that are also sort of advancing 
um, human dignity, equality, etc. Uh, even if the language is not the language of the West, and you know, you, there's a, an amazing flowering of um, you know lots of um, uh, traditions and values and and writing and activism. Uh, well, we see it in relation to the environment, but also in relation to to issues of equality, you know, from those indigenous traditions. And, you know, there are many African women theologians, for example, or Asian women theologians who are using uh, their traditions to challenge their own countries and contexts and to, you know, require them to, um, to, to meet the standards of the embedded uh, tradition in the same way as it as happens you know here in 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 the west mm. in many ways we're lucky in the west in that we can have these debates and then shape uh, our own political uh, landscape i think in particular of the the two referenda that stand out the same-sex marriage referendum in 2015 six years ago almost this week and uh, the uh, decision uh, three years ago to remove Article 8 from the Constitution. We at least had that democratic debate and reached uh, a reasonable consensus. It was almost as if the uh, referendum in 2018 exactly overturned by 67 to 33 yeah. percent the referendum that was held in 1983. Okay. We're lucky that we can have those debates and then have uh, a decision made that most people accept. Um, other countries aren't so lucky. And I think in particular of uh, the African countries where the churches are holding back on what we would regard as human rights. We mightn't have regarded it 50 years ago as a human right, but we do now. And that is, uh, I'm thinking in particular of uh, the attitude to uh, same sex relationships, uh, where it's a cultural thing in a lot of African countries to uh, to castigate and worse uh, people engaged in these acts. Can we help shape the thinking in that part of the world without diminishing their culture? Um, yes, but we have to do it as allies to those advocates from within the culture who are challenging those. I mean, that's that's my yes. view at least. Um, you know, as I said, my experience is that there are very many um, uh, people, scholars, activists uh, around the world who are challenging precisely those norms. Uh, and the way I think that, um, uh, you know, people from outside those cultures and contexts can, can help is by, first of all, saying, how can we help? Because sometimes we think that we can help, but actually our voice is, you know, a challenge or a problem rather than not. So I think we have to do that as allies and also supporting people um, in, in different ways, um, you know, in the ways that they need. So for, I, 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 and as an example of that, um, you know, I, I've been very involved over the years in, um, in the context of uh, Catholic um, control of healthcare in many, uh, in, in some African countries. Very, very involved in creating this um, scholarship system for uh, women, African women uh, who want to uh, be educated in medical ethics so that they can actually um, challenge and educate their doctors and nurses uh, so as to allow for um, you know, decisions about their reproduction, contraception, etc. Um, and uh, so you have to, you have to do it in ways that enable people within those contexts to actually identify what the issues are, what they need, and then support those needs. Um, I think, you know, we've seen that um, neo-colonialism has been a huge problem uh, and I, I think um, even a lot of the neocolonialism is with good intent. And so I think the, the, the real way that we can support is by, as I say, being allies and um, ensuring that we support people by giving them and by enabling them to 
uh, to, to do what they need to do, but in the ways that they feel are culturally appropriate and culturally acceptable. Mm. I'm thinking in particular of the way that uh, humanitarian organisations from Ireland engage in uh, difficult situations, in particular in Africa. And we're engaged in uh, uh, things like medicine, in education, whereas China is involved economically. They're building roads, they're building uh, hydroelectric dams, and their influence is likely to outlast ours. Uh, because of the infrastructural uh, work that they're doing, but they're not doing it out of uh, uh, philanthropy. It's mm -hmm. done to maintain influence. Mm -hmm. Has our work in uh, the developing, has, our, has the work of Irish missionaries, of Irish uh, charity personnel enhanced uh, our, Ireland's image uh, abroad? Oh, I think it has. And, you know, I, I think you're so right about China's influence. It's it's really extraordinary to see the level of investment that uh, the Chinese government has in, you know, different countries around Africa. It's staggering, actually, to realize that as you drive down any highway, you know, people will be pointing out that's the Chinese. They're building this hospital. They're building this hospital. They're this road, etc. So there's no doubt that China has decided that economic development is the way to ensure um, influence. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know how that is likely to go in the longer term, but I would say that um, there's absolutely no doubt that Irish missionaries, NGOs, you know, humanitarians have made it really and left a really indelible uh, mark on um, different um, uh, African countries and actually countries around the world. And I think you can see that in the standing that Ireland has held in organizations like the United Nations, where we really do have a reputation for, um, you know, uh, not only humanitarian um, uh, advocacy, but also for, you know, we're, we've been non-aligned from the beginning, and I think that as a small power has been hugely important as well. Uh, so I, I, there's no doubt, I think, that our reputation is hugely enhanced by our presence around the world, even if, um, you know, uh, it's, of course, it hasn't ever, nothing is ever universally positive. We, you know, we we uh, brought, um, you know, uh, I think uh, sometimes sets of values that didn't see the value of other cultures and contexts yeah. either. And so nothing is, I think, ever wholly good. No. Um, you know, it always has some ambivalence, I think. Yes, but never, neither is it always wholly bad. No, you know, exactly. Um, you know, if we were having this discussion 10 years ago, there are two items that wouldn't have ever emerged in our in our conversation, and they are artificial intelligence and climate change. Yeah. Uh, these are two huge issues that, is going, that are going to transform the world, both physically and intellectually. How do you see ethics playing a part in both of those issues? Um, there, it's absolutely central, actually. And, you know, one of the one of the interesting things in my experience is how um, how concerned many of the technologists are about artificial intelligence and about the ethical use of artificial intelligence. And we have um, in Trinity, we've got a, a very large um, research institute that's devoted to artificial intelligence called the ADAPT Centre. It's funded by Sands Foundation Ireland. And we have an ethics working group as part of that. Um, and so that's not only about teaching students, but it's also for the, those who are developing technologies so that they're thinking about the ethical questions about the ethical use at the same time as they're developing the technology. And I think that's the way it's got to ha happen, actually. There's no point in our developing the technology, adapting it, using it, and then asking, well, what are the consequences? You know, uh, uh, that's, I think, the way we've learned a lot about uh, uh, 
embedding ethical concerns in technology development from, from the field of bioethics and medicine, you know, over the last 50 years. And I, I see that there's um, a real recognition now that there has to be a kind of an ethical framing around the use of artificial intelligence. And of course, the European Union, with its trustworthy AI, um, uh, has really led the way there. And at the moment, I'm involved with a, in a discussion um, on behalf of the Irish government uh, in, in UNESCO. Again, UNESCO is putting together a standard. Hopefully, by the end of the summer, there'll be an agreed standard on the ethical use of artificial intelligence for all of the countries of UNESCO to adopt. Uh, and uh, I think there are a lot of concerns about, you know, reinscribing inequality, about uh, lack of use of privacy, lack of privacy about, you know, overriding human rights, uh, surveillance, society, all of these concerns that really do need to be um, uh, curtailed, uh, but in the context of recognizing the huge benefits that this technology can also bring. So again, it's all about balancing uh, the, um, uh, you know, the benefits and limiting the, the, um, the unethical use. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tech, it is a sort of a set of technologies that's developing all the time. And so, um, I think what's clear is that ethics has to be there from, as I said, from the beginning and embedded in the conversations rather than just sort of trying to scurry afterwards to yes. then sort of uh, deal with the consequences. And that's what's happening with social media at the moment. The 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 giant the the genie has got out of the bottle. It's very hard to uh, curtail the genie now that it's out. Um, the it, climate change is another issue that. Uh, we in the West can uh, comfortably say, yes, we must reduce our uh, carbon emissions, while other countries have yet to develop. And we use carbon emissions to develop to where we got. And we're now saying uh, that other countries can't do the same as we did. You know, um, climate change is such a big challenge to the world. And it needs, I think, people of the stature of Mary Robinson and others to be able to bring people with them. You know, I think we have to forget about the climate change deniers. The yeah. danger is that they're feeding into decision makers who are refusing to make the changes that the world actually needs. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. I, I mean, I would agree with you. Um, and I think Mary Robinson's climate justice approach is actually the right one. And uh, that is the approach that has been adopted in the Paris Agreement as well, which is to say that um, there you have to uh, uh, both address the challenges of climate change while also addressing the existing inequalities and making sure that as we address climate change, that we're not asking those who can least afford it to bear the burden of this adaptation. Um, and, you know, so, so I think we've got to do both at the same time. And, you know, uh, people are talking about uh, using the language of just transition in order to ensure that um, uh, while we wean ourselves off um, coal and other uh, carbon emitting uh, energy uh, uh, and, and also obviously in the agriculture context, that we have to ensure that this is done in a way that respects the, um, the livelihoods and supports the livelihoods of those who are going to be negatively affected. And that's true in the developing world, but it's also true, I think, um, you know, in Europe and other places as well, we cannot have a situation where uh, a, par a part of the community carries the burden for the rest of us as we, you know, make this necessary change. Mm. We're coming to the end of our conversation, but I'd like to open it up if any of the 11 people that are left uh, would like to ask Linda any questions uh, before we draw the, uh, the discussion to a conclusion. Is anyone there? Hello. 
Hi, Ian. Hi, good afternoon, Hi. Declan and Joan. Bonjour, Linda. Hi. Miss J. Ryan from Callan. I don't know. If oh, you've my been. goodness. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I, thank you very much. For an excellent speech. I can hear an awful lot of Father Jim Forrestal, Billy, ah, Gardner, Billy Gardner, and I'm sure Sister Mary Trace will be very, very proud of you. <laughs> Uh, it's lovely to see Joan. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, Father Jim Forrestal was a huge influence, actually. Um, yeah. He was an absolutely brilliant uh, teacher. He was the chaplain, but also the English teacher. Um, but he also inspired uh, sort of a generations of students to be, you know, interested in issues of social justice. And for at that time, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, it was all about um, nuclear power and CND. And so uh, he, um, you know, he inspired us all to be politically engaged. And he was really, really wonderful. And of course, Billy is a, 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 a relative as well, a cousin. So, yeah. That's the great joy of this uh, medium, uh, Linda, that uh, we wouldn't have been able to uh, gather around the, t uh, the table in the clubhouse uh, with you uh, during this busy time if it wasn't for the availability of something like Zoom. And then someone like Joan can join in uh, as well. Um, I want to thank you for uh, making the time available today uh, to, for joining us and providing such a fascinating insight into a topic that really should be on the uh, curriculum of every secondary school, indeed, every primary school. And indeed, uh, there should be television debates on this very topic because it's so fundamental to the way that we are led and the way out we are willing to allow our leaders to lead us. It would be great that if um, prior to any induction period for Dáil Éireann, that every potential TD uh, would undergo a course in ethics so as to ensure that they would adhere to at least their own values, whatever about uh, uh, the values of society. Um, I remember once uh, listening to some person saying, you know, uh, don't, uh, I won't necessarily do what you want me to do, but I will do what I believe is right. And so many politicians actually don't do what they believe is right. They know themselves that it's not uh, uh, that it's not right. And perhaps with an underground, uh, an underlining of ethics in their development, then perhaps we would live in a better society. Um, I hope that uh, you that Trinity emerges from the chrysalis uh, of COVID to uh, a bright new future uh, in the coming years. Um, thank you very much for making the time available to us today. Um, in two weeks time, we have another Callan person, Etienne Houlihan from Fenley's oh, restaurant joining us. Hey, and uh, uh, and uh, next week we have our AGM, our annual general meeting. It's again going to be conducted by Zoom, but I look forward to seeing all of the members who are available uh, uh, to join us then. In the meantime, thank you very much, Linda, for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Look uh, after yourself. Everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.